an honor to be speaking the word of God this morning. And I really do believe what I have on my heart is from God. Um, this is really, really loud. Um, I really feel like it's from God. And I'm, and honestly, I'm still wrapping my mind around this word that I feel like God's given me. Um, and if you don't know me, hi, my name is Sam, and I, and I get to lead the worship and creative team here at church. Um, and honestly, like it's, it's the honor and privilege of my life to be able to lead this church in worship and our worship team. Um, there's no place that I'd rather be. And I feel like as I've stepped into this, day after day, month after month, year after year, I realize like, I just want to put all my eggs in this basket. I just want to come to this altar of worship and give God honor and praise. Um, and that's what our church has been set apart to do, to worship. And like, there is an altar of worship that is built metaphorically, symbolically um, in this room even like specifically in this room, in this, in this round that we have here, there's a reason why we designed it as a round. It was to be an altar of worship. And um, in the middle of pandemic, when we were recording, we were kind of figuring out our way through it. And it was kind of like worship boot camp. And there came a time when we decided like, we're not gonna play games anymore. Like even if it's just five of us here in the room, like we will set ourselves apart to give God the worship and honor that is worthy and do his name. And we said the next time that we're able to gather as a church, people will come back to this altar and find a fire that is burning. And I feel like we have that today and we're experiencing it. And every Sunday we come here, every time we gather on a Wednesday, every time we gather in our homes over a meal with friends speaking about Jesus, we're continuing to add to that fire, continuing to bring him a sacrifice of worship that's worthy of his name. And so I feel like I have a word today that is from God and is a prophetic invitation for our church and it has so many ties with my life, but it is about us and what we're journeying through together as a church. And so I hope that um, you're here and you're in for the ride. And um, if you're new here, you're also welcome. Um, and so before I start, can we just all stand up one more time? And we're going to pray together. And I think our posture in worship is so important. We worship with our minds with our emotions, our heart, but also like with our bodies and our posture can can lead us into something in worship and can give honor to God. And so as we stand, let's stand at attention to the word of God here right now in this room. Spirit of God, we welcome you. We thank you that you're in this room. We treasure and we honor your presence here amongst us with your people. We thank you that we are your sheep and your sheep hear your voice. And so in this moment, we just incline your ear to what you have to say to us this morning. We long for a word and we long to respond and we long to obey. So just do something in us today that is like even beyond our understanding. Let our hearts burn today as we hear your word as we hear your truth, as we fix our eyes on Jesus, would you take us somewhere where we can see you, where we can hear you in a way that we never have before? In you are the words of life. We need it. We want it. Give it, give it to us today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we can sit down. Thanks, Josh. Okay. So how do I start? So like I said, I have a word today and it's out of Revelation 14 and 15. And quite literally, if the spirit of God is not speaking through my words, we will not understand what this word is about because Revelation is complicated. And I don't know, well, I know why I chose this because God's been speaking to me out of it. But I'm just, I'm just gonna be unpacking some things in real time as I have been hearing God speak to me through this. And, um, you know, I, in, when I went to Bible college many years ago, those were the days when I um, began to like, my heart began to burn for worship and what God was calling me to as a worshiper. And I prayed prayers behind closed doors that I, I don't even know how I learned to pray those prayers, but I prayed prayers behind closed doors that I feel like now, and even literally through this word, God's answering those prayers. He's like, okay, here, if, if you're asking for something, here it is. And um, 
so this is like a life song for me. Like this is, I, I hope I communicate this right. But if anything, I pray that you hear my heart and that you hear the heart of the Father in this. As it's a it's a message about worship. It's not about music specifically, but it's a message about worship. It's a message about worship. It's not just about music, but it's a message about who we are as worshipers and whether we think we're musical or not, or whether we think we have a good voice or we know how to play an instrument. That's besides the point. We're worshipers to our core. Like whatever we do, whatever we find ourselves in, whether you are a mom or you're a dad or you work in accounting or you um, are a business person or you are in real estate, whatever it is you find yourself doing, your life tells a story. Everything you do speaks of something. We're all worshipers because that's just the spiritual nature. That's the spiritual law. Like we're all going to worship something. And so this message is not about music, although there's going to be talk about music, um, but this message is about worship. And um, just even like a month ago, we were here on a Wednesday night and a prayer that was bubbling up was, God, we pray that you would give us a song and a sound in this house. And that was my prayer years ago in Bible college and is still to this day. Lord, would you give us a song that will mark generations? Would you give us a song that will compel the nations to worship you and to honor your name? And that song is representative of our lives, like what we speak of and that what comes out of our lives would cause people to see Jesus and to worship Jesus. Um, so I'm going to be unpacking this Revelation 14 and 15, and I don't necessarily have like a sculpted beginning, middle, or end, um, but I, I believe this, the Spirit of God is going to speak through this. Um, and so Revelation 14, it says this, Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb, standing on Mount Zion, and with him, 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters and like a loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like that of harpists playing their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the living creatures and the elders. No one could learn this song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remain virgins. They follow the lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among mankind and offered as first fruits to God and the lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. And in chapter 15, it says again of these people, I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with the seven last plagues last because with them God's wrath is completed. And I saw what looked like a sea of glass glowing with fire and standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast and its image and over the number of its name. They held harps given them by God and they sang the song of God, God's servant Moses and the lamb. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God almighty, just and true are your ways. King of the nations, who will not fear you, Lord, and bring the glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you for your righteous acts have, have been revealed. So I'm going to speaking, be speaking through this. And again, I feel like this is a prophetic invitation from God for us. And the one line that has captivated my attention for the past two weeks has been this. In, chapter, in, in verse, verse 3, they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders no one could learn this song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. I don't know if this like rattles you in the same way that it rattles me. Um, as we talk about worship in the church, so many times we are taught, rightly so, that we want to sing the song that is in, being sung in heaven, right? Have you guys heard this before? that we want to sing the song that the angels are singing. And if they're singing, holy, 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 if they're singing, worthy is the lamb, I want to be singing that song because it's that, the activity in heaven that matters. It's the activity in heaven that changes things. It's, it's, it's the angels getting this profound picture of the lamb and who Jesus is. 
um, I want to be singing that song. I want, I want what's on my lips to be purely about the Lord. But I, but I read this verse and I, and I had it read this verse before and it shook me to the core and it felt like the answers to my prayers. As we've been asking God to shape the sound and the song of our house, he says to us this, there is a new song before the throne and before the four living elders and no one can learn this song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. The 144,000 represents all of God's redeemed people. And so Revelation is like, is full of imagery and like, if I don't know if you've read it, but it's, it's super confusing. And what's actually helped me a lot um, is this book um, by Pastor Dale Johnson, Discipleship on the Edge. It's a really good um, resource to help unpack Revelation because Revelation is so full of metaphor and imagery and it's, it's a letter to the churches, but it's also prophetic writing. Um, and it takes a lot of time to like to work through the metaphor to fully understand what's being said. But there's something about metaphor and imagery that like speaks about truth in a way that's like truer than if we were to literally say it. That's why in so many of the prophetic books, like they the, the prophets use image, they use allegory, they use symbols to to tell what's on God's heart. And even today, as we're trying to grab hold of what's on God's heart. We're trying to grab hold of a truth that he has for us. We're trying to grab hold of a reality that he has for our lives and our community. But there's an essence of it that is like mysterious, right? It's like when someone is saying something and you don't quite know what they're saying, but like your, your eyes are welling up with tears or your heart is burning. Like it's that thing where like it's testifying to something in my spirit. Like I know it's true. But like, there's something in my mind that's still trying to grab hold. And literally, as I'm talking to you right now, I'm still trying to grab hold. And let's grab hold of it together. Because God has a truth for us to discover. And um, again, like the idea of, of, of singing a song, that's, that's just a metaphor for a truth that God is wanting us to walk out. This message is not about music. It's about us stepping into the call and identity that he has for us as disciples, as worshipers, as a church. Um, that we would sing the song that we were destined to, that we would receive that song. And so in this verse, it says that there's 144,000 that could only learn this song. And 144,000 redeems, uh, represents all of the redeemed of God throughout all of history. So if you take 12 times 12 is 144, 12 being the 12 tribes of Israel and 12, the other 12 being the 12 disciples, all of God's redeemed. Um, and that's a very special number, right? But then if you take it times 10, times 10 again, times 10 again, you get 144,000. And 10 is a number of like perfection and completeness. And there's three times of 10. So like there's 144 um, times, sorry, 12, my math is really bad. I'm more of a music person. Oh, it's right by me. 12 times 12 times 10 times 10 times 10. It's a symbol of all of God's redeemed people which includes us. It's the redeemed people of all of history that have gone before us and who will come after us. It's these people that sing this song. It's these people, only these people can learn this song. That rattles me. I'm like, I wanna learn this song as a songwriter, as a worshiper, as someone who's trying to articulate the truths of God, as a church that's been set apart to declare the greatness of God, even to, to set apart to write songs, I want us to sing this song. I want to sing what the angels are singing, but also I want to sing this song because not even the angels can learn this song. It says that they were before the throne, before the elders and before the four living creatures. And it doesn't say this in, this, in the text, but I get a picture of, the, of all of God's redeemed in the throne room before the elders, before the angels, before the four living creatures, before the lamb singing this song. And I wonder if the redeemed is teaching all of heaven this song wow. Wow. that no one else could learn except for the redeemed. What is it about this song? I want to know. I don't quite know it yet, but I want to know. Like there's something in my spirit that like it resounds in me. And I believe God is calling us to learn this song. I think we've already been singing it in pieces. Even today, as we've been worshiping, like it's a, it's an essence thing. It's a spirit thing. We've been tasting it. It's been on our lips. It's been on our mouth. But as we bring articulation today, there will be more conviction, more direction, 
more vision to, to continue to sing this song together, the song of the, of the redeemed. Um, so we are part of the 144,000. When you read that, consider yourself in that. Um, I'm really all over the place, but we're just <laughs> along for the ride. Um, and so here's the thing about the 144,000. Even as we as a church are desiring to sing and learn this song, even as we are trying to find the words for this, as, even as we're trying to learn how to live out more fully, more correctly, um, our life as the church, as disciples, this song isn't just our song. It's more of a symphony, right? Because we join in with something that's happened way before us and will go on way after us. But we're called today to play our part in that symphony, to play the part that there's so many different layers, there's so many different parts. Um, but for the song to be complete, we must step in. For the song to be complete, we must take our place as worshipers, as disciples, as church untitled in this day and age, in 2022. And the years, so long as we're alive, so long as we have breath in our lungs, living for the Lord, we have to take our place. And I'm gonna talk more about that because it's a song for the generations as well. But this, this isn't just like us having the song and being the big shots and like, you know, look at me, look at my life, look at all that I'm good at and what I do. I'm so set apart for God. Like, yeah, we are set apart for God, but we're part of this grand story. And it's like the opportunity of a lifetime in humility that we are able to grab hold of this and step in to this, this revelation. Um, so this is all like, it's all a truth mystery in some sense. And there's a writer that I love that says that mystery is not something that um, cannot be known, but it, mystery is something that can be endlessly known, that we can know it again and again and again and again and again. And the thing about revelation is that it's revelation, singular, right? That when John, who wrote this book, he was in a prison cell on the island of Patmos. It was in a time where the Roman Empire was persecuting Christians and he was banished, sent off into this prison cell. And John was the one who identified himself as the one that, that Jesus loved. He identified himself as the beloved of Christ, this man of intimacy who knew, who, who reclined on the chest of Jesus. And this was the man who was entrusted with the revelation. These are the people, the people of intimacy are entrusted with this revelation, but it's a one singular revelation. So often when we talk about the books of the Bible, we say, oh, like revelations, like plural, but it's not. But the interesting thing is if you read Revelation, if you've read it, it's multiple scenes, like many scenes that John is writing to the church and, he's, and, and the spirit is, is taking him to a place to behold all these things that are happening in the heavenlies, to see a lamb sitting on a throne, to see you know a sea of glass, to see... Um, many plagues being poured out, to see many prayers being risen up to heaven, to see all these different things and all these, all these different um, images, but they all speak of one thing, one revelation, even though there's many metaphors and many things, it's only speaking of one thing. And it's speaking of the lamb who is sitting on the throne, who was slain, who has overcome and triumphant and who has overcome the world. This is the one revelation. This is the revelation that John is bringing to the churches, even though he's seeing so many different things. And all of our songs, all of these sermons, all of our, everything we say in worship, it's all attempts to say the one thing, that he is worthy. And he's worthy of all my hallelujahs. He is worthy of every song that I might wanna bring him. He's worthy of every um, sermon that will be preached up here. He's worthy of it all. And all of everything is just an attempt, just like a million different ways to say one thing, that the lamb is worthy. Um, and so as we uncover this mystery, we're uncovering this one thing, that he is worthy. And it's not that his worthiness cannot be known, but it, that it's like it's endlessly known again and again and again and again and again and again. We can come to it again and again. And we can come to it and we can realize how worthy our God is we can realize, we can see again, oh wow, the lamb is on the throne. He is slain and he has overcome. 
that like when we feel like we're in prison cells, when we feel like the world is dark, when we feel like there's persecution, when we feel like the lamb has not overcome, we can come into the throne room. The spirit of God will lead us there and we will see the lamb who has overcome, who takes away the sin of the world. And that is part of the song. I believe that's part of the song that we're meant to declare. We, we sang it today already, that he has overcome. We raise a hallelujah because he has defeated all our enemies. He is our way maker. Like all these different ways just to say he is worthy. He is king. He is alive. Um, and we have to know that reality deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. It's just like Paul says, like, in some ways, it's a knowing beyond knowing. It's like beyond even like our words could ever say. Um, I pray that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened, that you would understand the surpassing knowledge of the love of God. Like just this understand the love of God that surpasses knowledge. Like, yeah, sure, I can articulate it. I can say God loves you but that you would feel it to the fiber of your being, that at the fiber of who we are, we know that Christ is alive, that the lamb has overcome, that he is sitting on the throne, that the situation in Ukraine, he is alive and he is reigning over that, over everything, over all our lives, over every single detail, he is alive. And I think that's what gives us power and authority as a church. When we, not only do we say it with our speech, not only do we just sing it, but every part of our DNA, like it's, I don't even know how to describe it, it's more of like a body felt thing where like you just feel the truth like deep within you. It's a conviction. It's faith. It's a knowing beyond all knowing. Um, and God wants us, wants, to, wants us to receive that today. Um, and so the song of 144,000 is a song of the redeemed. So I'm just like, I'm literally just gonna unpack this and I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go line by line. And I feel like God has a lot for us in this. And this is all leading up to us just worshiping again and being activated and realizing again, just how worthy he is. Um, Revelation 14, then I looked and there before me was the lamb standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. So the name of the lamb and the father's name was written on their foreheads, meaning that they were identified by the name of the lamb. That was their I identity. We are church untitled, but we want to be known by his name. We are known by the, lamb, by the name of the lamb written on their foreheads. Um, and I heard a sound from heaven like a roar of rushing waters and a loud peal of thunder. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures. No one could learn the song except the 144 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remain virgin. They follow the lambs wherever he goes. They were purchased from among mankind and offers at first fruits to God and the lamb. This thing that they were purchased, I think we should focus on that for a second. They were purchased. It's the same thing as, as their identity that like, they once belonged to another kingdom. They once belonged to the kingdom of darkness. In Revelation, it talks about Babylon and the beast, all different ways to say that they were not living in the way of God, that, that, they, that they, were, they belonged to the Satan, to the beast, to, to ways that were not of God. And we can, we're all in that boat. We all once belonged to something else other than the lamb but it is Christ that has purchased us. And it is by Christ that we are redeemed. This is the song of the redeemed. And I think we have to understand this redemption. I grew up in church and we, I heard the word redemption a lot. And it, got, it gets to the point where it's repeated so much that it becomes a cliche and it feels like, oh yeah, God just waves his wand and like things are redeemed. But if we understand that's not how it happened. He doesn't wave a wand, he like went to the cross. He took the road of suffering intentionally. Your redemption was thought of and planned and strategized. He had this in his heart all along that you would redeemed, that you would be bought back from the powers of darkness and belong into his family and be adopted and belong to the lamb. And so this redemption that we have is not cheap. 
it came with a price. And we have to understand that if we're going to sing the song of the lamb, we have to know, we have to know this redemption. We have to know how redeemed we are. We have to know how costly it is that we once belonged to the kingdom of darkness. Why did I choose paper? We all, we all belong to the kingdom of darkness, but now we belong to God's family. Um, that he, the price was high and the price was his blood. The price, price was him taking the road of suffering. And you've heard us sing a lot in, in church the past few months. May the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. And the reason why we sing this is because we realize that he paid a price for us. It cost him. It cost him everything. It cost the father everything to give of himself, to give his only son, to redeem us from the powers of darkness, that we would be part of the kingdom of light. It cost him everything. And this is why we sing, may the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. Because if Jesus died for my freedom, I want to live in full freedom. If Jesus died for the nations, he will deserve the, he deserves the healing and the, and the worship of the nations. If he died for your marriage to be restored, then I don't want him to die in vain. If he died for my life, for the lies that I believe to, to be rewritten so that I would believe truth, I'm going to give my life to that end so that his, the cost that he paid would receive its full reward. I don't, he's not going to die in vain. He's redeeming all things, but I have a part to play in it, right? He will redeem all things, but he's created us as image bearers, us as a church to play a part in his redemption. And from our lives, worship will come. From our lives, a song will be sung and he will receive the reward due his name. The lamb that was slain will receive the reward of his suffering. And this story comes from two missionaries who were part of the Moravian revival. And um, it was a prayer movement and they were just praying and praying, and praying and a big outpouring of the spirit that also led to missions. And there's, there's two um, young men who knew of an island in Africa that had not heard the gospel of Jesus yet. And they decided that they would give their lives to go there. But the only way that they could go to that island, there was no other way. The only way was to sell themselves into slavery. And it was in this pursuit, they went onto the boat and it was said that as they were looking out onto the shore and the people that were saying goodbye to them, they, they, they put their fists in the air and they said, may the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. They understood how much this cost Jesus, but they also understood that they belonged to the lamb. That even if they sold themselves into slavery, they belonged to the lamb. It transcended everything. And so no matter what situation we find ourselves in, maybe we feel like we're, we're struggling through depression or anxiety. We're struggling to be free. We're struggling to believe the truth of God. Take heart and still believe that there's something that transcends all of that, that transcends your situation, that we belong to the lamb, that we belong to him and nothing can snatch us from his hands. Nothing could take us away from him. Um, and so if we want to sing the song of the lamb, if we want to learn this song, we have to understand redemption. And there's something about redemption that causes us to sing a song of pure worship. Because when we understand how much we've been forgiven, then we can also forgive much and we can exalt Jesus and we can praise him for all that he's done in our lives. Um, the next point I want to highlight is this okay that I'm just going through this verse? Okay. Um, it says that these are those who did not defile themselves with women for they remain virgin. They follow the lamb wherever he goes. And so when, he, when, when John talks about they did not defile themselves with women, they remain virgin, he's talking about sexual purity, but it's not just about sexual purity. Again, it's, it's a symbol. It's a metaphor for the purity of heart. When we say purity a lot in church, we're not just talking about sexual purity, even though maybe we grew up associating that word in that way. But it's about purity of our heart. And, and these people that sang the song remained pure is basically what it's saying. They knew who they belonged to. They knew that they were the, the bride, the beloved of Christ. 
And when we sing this song, we're singing it also as the bride. And it's so important that as we continue to live our lives, that, we're, that, we, that we seek to cultivate a heart of purity. A heart of purity. It matters so much to the Lord. It matters so much that we aren't singing half-heartedly, that we're not singing with bitterness in our hearts. That's why in the, in the word, Jesus says, like, if you know that someone has something against you, go to them before you offer the offering. Because it's something about, like, the heart that Christ really cares about. And the purity of our heart matters. Um, it also says in verse 5 that no lie was found in their mouths, that they are blameless. So loyal love and devotion to the Lamb is of, is of utmost importance. And staying in intimacy with the bridegroom, Jesus, is so important. That we don't compromise our lives by being devoted or in love with other things. We are singularly focused, in love, enraptured, engaged to the Lamb. That's who we are. That's who the church is, the bride of Christ, engaged to the Lamb. And it is this people that learn the song of the Lamb. Loyal love and devotion matters. Um, and again, John was the one entrusted to, with this revelation. And he was the one that was devoted in intimacy with Jesus. Um, the next thing I want to point out, that this is, it was called the Song of Moses. The Song of Moses and the Song of the Lamb. I don't think it's two songs, but I think it's two songs that carry the same thing and symbolize the same thing. It says that they were given harps to them by God and they sang the song of God's servant Moses and of the song of the lamb. And so the song of Moses, there's, there's two instances of the song of Moses. The first song, and it was the first song ever recorded in the Bible, is in Exodus 15 when they crossed the Red Sea. That when God delivered his people, there it is again, redemption. That when God delivered his people, Moses sang the song, and it was called the Song of Moses. And it's the song that's referred to again as we read this in Revelation at the very end. It's one of the last songs that we'll be singing. But the thing about the Song of Moses is that it's not a song about Moses. It's called the Song of Moses, but the subject of the song is God. The subject of the song is Yahweh. And it's so important for us to understand that. I've come to realize, you know, as a worship leader even, in sculpting set lists and deciding what songs we're gonna sing on Sunday, I've analyzed the songs we've sung and I've realized, whoa, a lot of the times, I'm not actually singing about Jesus. A lot of times, I'm putting myself at the center of it. I'm the subject of this song. And I wanna be nuanced in saying that that's not all wrong, right? Um, God wants our hearts. He wants us to bring our full selves to worship him. He actually wants to take care of the brokenhearted. That's, his ear is attentive to the brokenhearted. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, what is worship about? God is the subject. I am not the subject. I am glo we are glorifying God. And it's so important that we understand this. It's so important that we understand what worship is. And we, we do it often and we sing it often and we think we know, but I don't think we really know. Like even, even me, like I've been leading worship for years and I feel like I'm just realizing, oh yeah, this is what worship is. Like, okay, yeah, this is what it means to bring him a song, bring him an action, bring him my life that is worthy of his name. Like, oh, I'm understanding this mystery again. I'm coming back and I'm learning a new depth of how worthy he is. Um, so what is worship? It's important that we know that the subject of our worship, who is God, defines worship. He defines what worship is because we're the one who's, wor we're worshiping him. So if we're worshiping him, he gets to decide what's pleasing to him. Um, and this is also a journey of maturity, right? Because, you know, five years ago, I, worship, I thought I knew worship and I, I, and I gave him the best that I could. And I believe that he loved it and, he, and, and, and it pleased his heart. But as we progress, as we mature, and as I fall more in love with him, I want to give him exactly what he wants. It's like being a good friend or being a spouse or giving a gift to a parent. If you really love the person, you're going to know their love language. You're going to know what they desire. So if my friend enjoys quality time, 
but doesn't really care about acts of service, <laughs> then I'm going to give them quality time because that's what they want. And it's the same with God. Like I could be a kid just giving him a doodle and he's going to love it. He's going to put it on his fridge. But as I grow up and as I learn the heart of God, I want to continue to know what he loves. And God defines um, the desires that please him or the things that please him. Um, he defines our worship. And so even in, as an example, like a lot of the songs that we sing together, um, oftentimes they are songs, and I believe me, I, God loves all of this. So I'm just going to say that from the outset. God loves all of it. There are songs of repentance. There are songs we sing when we're like needing breakthrough. There are songs that we sing um, of lament. There are songs that we sing of devotion. Um, but not all of those songs are worship songs. Right. Worship is giving him the honor that is due his name. Yeah. It's talking about his worthiness. It's exalting him. It's adoring him. It's, it's all those things. But if I'm coming into a time of worship through prayer, through music, through whatever it is, and um, I'm just giving God my feelings, right. but I'm mistaking that for worship, that's not correct worship. Yeah. And it, God still wants our hearts. He wants us to come honestly. But as I mature, I want to give God the worship that he desires, right? And so I'll bring my feelings for sure. <laughs> but I'm going to direct it all towards his worthiness. I'm going to direct everything I am towards his holiness and the glory of his name. So I don't want to mistake. I don't want to get it confused. It's important that we know exactly what worship is. Because worship is putting God first. If I don't know how to put God first, then everything else is going to be a mess. If I'm putting my feelings first and I think that's worship, then it, it's all going to be a mess. This is why it's so important for us to understand what worship is, even though we think we know what it is. Um, another analogy, it's like, you know, different drinks that we have. It's, you know, coffee and tea and kombucha. Um, it's all created in a different way. You put the coffee beans with water. You put the tea bag in with water. We put, you ferment things with water and tea with kombucha. They're all beverages, but it's not all pure water. Like it all contains an aspect of, of, of water in it, but I can't confuse coffee for water because that's not gonna quench my thirst. That's not gonna heal my body. It might wake me up a little bit. <laughs> but like I, we need to know what real worship is. And sometimes it gets packaged with other things and that's okay. But we need to know how to put God first. Because when God is first, when God is exalted, I believe this with all my heart, if we know how to worship God and we can exalt him, exalt him in this city, then we're gonna see things happen all around us that we could only dream of because we've exalted God and we know how to put him at the highest place. And we're a people, we're a church. We're going to know how to worship and we're going to know how to sing this song, the song of the lamb. Um, okay. Just a few more things before I wrap up. Um, this is a song of Moses. Now, the second time that the Song of Moses is mentioned in the Bible is Deuteronomy 32. So the first time was Exodus 15, when they crossed the Red Sea. But this time in Deuteronomy 32 is when Moses is speaking to the Joshua generation. He's speaking to the generation that's about to enter the Promised Land, that's about to cross the Jordan. And God says, I want you to teach them this song because I know they're going to rebel. I want you to teach this song because I know they're going to rebel, but they have to know the way that they've been delivered and they have to know that I am God and they have to know that I am holy and they have to know that this nation belongs to me. I know they're going to rebel, but I need you to give them this song so that they can come back to this song. And this song was given before they crossed the Jordan. So this time it wasn't after the crossing the sea. This time it was before. And so there's another, another concept of maturity there. But what I want to highlight in this is that we have to take our place in singing this song in the same way that people who have come before us and sang this song, 
we have to know how to sing a song. And I, and I believe that God wants to give us songs that will mark a generation. Um, that these will be songs that your children will be singing, will, can come back to. That they were like, oh, I remember Uncle Brandon singing that song in worship. Let's sing it again. You know how we like sing vineyard songs often and again, or like we sing old school, shout to the Lord, and there's just something about them. It's kind of like that. It's like going back to that thing and, we're, and, and the generation before will rediscover something. But we have to step into the symphony. We have to play our part. And again, I just, I've been saying a lot about song, but I just want to reiterate, this isn't music. This is the calling of your life. This is who you are as a disciple, as a worshiper of Jesus. And whatever you find yourself in, like walk in that calling, in that purpose, knowing that you belong to the Lamb, knowing that your life is saying something, your life is testifying something. I was talking to my mom the other week, and she was asking me, like, what is it about worship that you love so much? And my answer to her was, like, it's just a place where I feel my, the most myself and the most, like, alive when I'm, like, behind this piano and, and in church and singing and worshiping Jesus. Like, it's the place where I feel most myself. And my mom was like, oh, yeah, that's how I feel when I'm, like, doing financial planning in front of my clients, <laughs> which does, it doesn't make sense to me. But she's like, I feel most alive when I'm in the boardroom and like talking to, uh, you know, who about their finances and whatever. And like, I don't understand that. But that's her, that's her worship. That's her calling. That's the song of her life. And so even if you don't understand what I'm saying when it comes to the song and worship, that's okay. Like, you know, the spirit of God is showing you what it is for your life. Your life speaks of something. What is, if you could... Put it in one sentence. What do you want your life to speak of? And we would all have a different answer, but it would all say the same thing. Jesus is worthy. It would all be different angles to say the same thing, that he is worthy. Um, so, I mean, even take a moment right now, as I look through my notes. <laughs> take a moment now, and what is that thing? What is that thing that God has deposited in you? Like, it's like a fire shut up in your bones. And that if you don't do that thing, you're not fully living. And if you don't have that thing, I pray in Jesus' name right now that you would speak, that you would give that spark, that flame, that ember, that you would impart that gift. Would you reveal it? Would it come to mind right now what it is that you've called us individually to? He's given us all something, and we all need to step into it. Um, the band can come back up as we wrap. I saw in heaven, chapter 15, another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with the seven last plagues, because with them God's wrath is complete. This is the setting where this song is taking place. God's final judgment, which is also his redemption. His judgment is against evil, which means it's a redemption for everything. This is the setting in which the song takes place. That when calamity and things are happening around us, we sing the song of worship. And I saw what looked like a sea of glass glowing with fire and standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast and its image and over the number of its name. They held harps given them by God. This is the next thing I wanna highlight. They held harps given them by God. It was given to them by God. The harp, which represented this musical worship, which represented this song, it was given to them by God. And if we're gonna continue to walk out in the call of God over our lives and over this church, we need to receive from God. And this song, it has to be imparted by God. It's not gonna be of our own striving. It's not gonna be of our own doing. But what God is giving us is not weapons. It's not picket signs. He didn't give them a smartphone. He didn't give them, oh, here's a book. You'll, you'll learn everything you need to learn. He gave them a harp. He gave them worship. It wasn't anything else. He gave them worship. 
And that's what I feel like God's giving us today. He's giving us a revelation, something to carry. And I still don't have words for it, but it's like the thing that burns within you. And he's, he's activating that again to a newer level. He's giving us a song. And um, all of New Testament actually, you know, Revelation is about the end times, kind of. Um, <laughs> Revelation about the end times. And, um, but it's a message not of doom and gloom. It's a message of victory. It's a message of redemption and hope and the lamb has overcome. If you're living on the wrong side, yeah, it's gonna be doom and gloom. <laughs> That's just the reality of it. But the beauty of it is for everyone. The gospel is for everyone and it's for the sake and the good of the world. And God is coming against, but he's coming against the evil that is, that is, that is ruining humanity and is ruining God's plan for life and redemption. God's, God's not coming against you. He's, you're his child. But he's coming against the evil thoughts that are in your mind. He's coming against the things that are derailing you from his plan. And the message of Revelation is not one of doom and gloom. It's one of victory and triumph and rejoicing. Um, and I've been wondering, oh, I was going to say something. <laughs> so... In, in all of the New Testament, like the early church was aware that they were living in the end times. And we've been in the end times for thousands and thousands of years. But it's important to know, to, 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 like, to get this revelation that the lamb is coming. And that's, what's that, that's what we're awaiting. And that's what we're longing for. Um, and I've been wondering, like, I do a lot of wondering. Like, I, I just wonder what, I, I, if, if God, if Jesus is coming back, if I just see him, envision him, like, walking the streets in this wonderful, majestic procession, or if I see him coming on the clouds, like, I just wonder what the soundtrack to his coming would be. I wonder what the environment of his coming is going to be like. And again, our lives speak of something. Our lives will contribute to the spiritual atmosphere of those around us and of this city. And if Jesus is coming and I'm longing for his coming, how can I welcome him? What is the sound? What is the soundtrack to his coming? And I've also been wondering, what does it sound like for a free people to sing? What's the sound of a free people? I feel like we've been uncovering that a little bit together as a church. But I feel like there's an invitation for us today to step in again deeper into that call, that our lives would sing of the Lamb, that everything we do, the way we interact with our family, the way we interact with our coworkers, that everything would say the Lamb has overcome. Everything would say the Lamb is worthy. Everything would say that Jesus is King. Um, so from here on out, as we continue to discover this mystery, we're going to be singing together the song of Moses, the song of the Lamb, as a church.